call the meeting to order. Welcome everybody to the uh, Planning Commission meeting today. Uh, and any changes to the um, agenda? No agenda changes. Okay, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Got a motion to second to adopt the agenda. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Agenda is now official. Uh, need approval or any changes or additions to the October 13, 2011 minutes? There's a motion to approve. New approval. Second. second. Motion second to approve the minutes of October 13, 2011. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any council members in the audience that uh, there's a lot of new ones that I don't recognize just yet? I think so. None here? Okay. <laughs> I don't think they're able to hear. Okay. And any um, items on deferral? No, sir. No items to be deferred or withdrawn. Okay. Would you uh, give us a list of items that uh, requested be on consent? Yes, and before we get to that, uh, let me give the audience this information. If you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may, may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact Independent Legal Counsel. Now we're moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at one single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or a member of the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So here are the items on today's proposed consent agenda. If you'll look on your agenda on page five, item number five. Nashville Commons at Skyline, Murphy Oil. It's a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final approval for a portion of the Nashville Commons at Skyline put overlay at 3435-4 Doverside Drive to permit an automobile convenience facility. And the staff recommends approval with conditions. On page six, item six, this is the Brownsville subdivision. It's a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property at 1521 Straightway Avenue. Staff recommends approval with a condition. Item number seven. This is Corby's three lot subdivision, a request for final plat approval to create three lots on properties at 7651 and 7661 Charlotte Pike and to approve a variance from the street frontage requirement at Forest Valley Drive southwest of Charlotte Pike. And staff rec recommends approval with a condition and approval of the variance request for street frontage. On page six, item eight, this is amendment two for contract L2268 between Metro government on behalf of the MPO and PB Americas for general planning services. Staff recommends approval. Item nine, amendment two to contract L2203 between Metro government on behalf of the MPO and RPM transportation consultants for the Southwest Area Land Use and Transportation Study. Staff recommends approval. Item 10, this is the fiscal year 2012 contract between Metro government on behalf of the MPO and the Greater Nashville Regional Council for the Unified Planning Work Program tasks 5.0 multimodal planning and 8.0 public involvement. Staff recommends approval. Item number 11, fiscal year 2012 contract between Metro government on behalf of the MPO and the TMA group for UPWP task 4.0, congestion mitigation air quality. Staff recommends approval. Item number 12, fiscal year 2012 contract between Metro government on behalf of the MPO and the Regional Transportation Authority for Unified Planning Work Program Task 5.0, Multimodal Planning. Staff recommends approval. And finally, number 13, the HUD grant application for Middle Tennessee Sustainable Communities. Staff recommends approval of the submittal. And that's the end of the consent agenda.
Okay, staff's recommendations were items on consent are item 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Is there a motion to accept those? Motion second for the, those items on consent. All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Those items now have been approved by the Planning Commission on consent. We're going to hear uh, items one, two, and three, which is, pertains to the former city of Lakewood. And we'll hear all those uh, one, two, and three, and then we'll vote on them. We'll discuss them, vote on them separately. Okay, um, this is now item number one on your agenda. And item number one on your agenda is 2011 CP 014002. And that is the amendment to the Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan for the former city of Lakewood. Somewhat lengthy caption because there are a number of land use policies involved. This is uh, a request to amend. It's the Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan, last updated in 2004. And the properties total a little over 553 acres within the former city of Lakewood, from residential low-medium density, neighborhood general, community center, corridor general, and open space, to conservation, T3 suburban open space, T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance, T3 suburban mixed-use corridor, T4 urban neighborhood maintenance, T4 urban mixed-use neighborhood, and T4 urban mixed-use corridor. This is requested by the Metro Planning Department, and you will please also see associated zone change cases number 2011-Z018-PR001 and 2011-SP022-001. These will presentations will immediately follow this this staff presentation, and the recommendation is to approve. A little history, um, the city of Lakewood, the former city of Lakewood, was a separately incorporated satellite city within the, the metropolitan Nashville city, uh, limits. And it became part of the city of Nashville by a fairly close vote on May 28, 2011. Since that date, Metro has been enforcing Lakewood zoning districts that were in place as of that date. Lakewood was already part of the Donaldson and Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan that was last updated in 2004. However, Lakewood had made changes to its own community plan and zoning ordinances since 2004, which of course have been addressed in metros and planning and zoning updates that are before you today. As mentioned earlier, Lakewood is part of the Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory community, um, numbered 14 on the map, uh, approximately where the red star is shown. And that plan was last updated in 2004 and has been amended several times since then, including um, earlier this year. To make some distinctions between the community plan amendment that I'm describing versus the rezoning that Brenda Bernards is going to describe for you in a few minutes, the Metro, uh, the, the proposed rezoning to Metro's code preserves existing development entitlements, while the community plan amendment does provide for future changes as well. Lakewood is mainly a developed community, so future changes are not expected to be significant in character or extent in the near future. There are three basic types of character areas in Lakewood, open space, neighborhoods, and a major corridor, which is Old Hickory Boulevard. The open space in Lakewood is suburban and urban, I mean suburban, I'm sorry, and the neighborhoods in Old Hickory Boulevard corridor are split between suburban and urban, most of it being suburban. The map that you see before you now shows the overall recommended land use policy plan as amended for the former city of Lakewood. And one of the things that you will notice about this map is that the city itself um, is fairly small, or the former city itself is fair, fairly small and compact, and it's also very much confined um, within its boundaries by natural boundaries, being the Cumberland River, 
Um, the Old Hickory Lake, also part of the Cumberland River, and golf courses that are on the west side. It's also uh, bounded by the Old Hickory community on the north and uh, suburb, suburban hermitage to the south. And it's very has a very defined and distinct identity because of that geography. Another thing that can be told from this map by the just dominant pink color is that most of Lakewood is suburban in character, and most of it is residential in character. In the north uh, east corner, you can see that there is a, a darker area that is the urban neighborhood that is referred to by the local people as Dupontonia because. <coughs> This is one of the factory neighborhoods that was built in association with the DuPont plant in Old Hickory. So, so now we will go through the policies by category, open space neighborhoods and co corridors. And there are, uh, as I had mentioned, the, the open space areas are suburban and there are two of them. One of them is the new Lakewood Victory Park off Ray a Avenue, which has not been developed or open to the public yet and is being taken over by Metro Parks. This policy area contains a lake, floodplain, and wetlands. The policy recognizes the need to protect these sensitive natural features and that, that it should be thoughtfully considered as the park is prepared and programmed for, pub, for public use. And this park is also adjacent to two large golf courses, one to its south and one to its north. The former Lakewood City Park on Pitts Avenue and Old Hickory Boulevard is the other open space area outlined in red here, and it contains ball fields and is a typical suburban um, ball field park. And this policy, uh, the open space policy, is applied only to public parks or other publicly secured open space. And in this case, we see that it represents two examples, one of an active park and the other of a passive, more undisturbed park that would be expected to have things more like greenways or trails in it and mainly preserve the uh, wetlands, et cetera. There's also a small area of conservation policy, and it might look a little curious on the map as uh, exactly how does one access this privately owned lot that has a house on it that's part of a larger floodplain area. Actually, this person that owns this house um, on this large lot accesses it through the parkland, but it is privately owned property, so we can't just put it in open space. The person would like to stay there. There are established suburban character residential areas in Lakewood, and we sort of loosely refer to these as the lake side and the golf course side. They contain numerous subdivisions and neighborhoods within them, and there is certainly room for infill despite their um, largely established condition. One thing to be aware of about these neighborhoods, particularly the neighborhood on the north side of Old Hickory Boulevard or the lake side, is that it's definitely somewhat sandwiched in by the commercial development that's on the Old Hickory Boulevard side and then by the physical fact of the lake being there. So you may notice that, for example, the mixed-use corridor policy has varying depths of development. Um, that has something to do with the fact that leaving enough space over for the residential area in between it and the lake to continue to be able to thrive. And this T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance policy that applies to these areas doesn't mean no change can happen, just that it needs to fit in well with what already exists in the area. Again, the urban neighborhood maintenance area applies to this Dupontonian neighborhood in the northwest that's adjacent, or in the northeast, that's adjacent to the uh, Dupont Hadley Middle School and the marina and the old Hickory community. And it is um, an, a typical urban neighborhood. It's mainly single family like the rest of Lakewood, but it's on small lots, has alleys, very compact, and um, a very developed area. And again, um, we're maintaining the developed character of this area, but allowing for some infill and redevelopment. 
The suburban mixed-use corridor area extends along in front of, partly in front of the urban neighborhood, which is um, starting it, if you're familiar at all, if you've been up to Lakewood area, there's an old theater building that now has a health food store in it. This suburban mixed-use neighborhood, um, I mean, suburban mixed-use corridor policy extends from that health food store all the way down to the former uh, Lakewood city limits near Andrew Jackson Elementary School. And it's mainly on this lake side of Old Hickory Boulevard. And again, you can see that there are varying depths of the parcels. Right here in this area nearer to Dupontonia, the parcels are, the depth of the policy is quite deep about 400 feet, and then it drops back significantly as it heads further south back towards the city of Nashville. And the reason that we didn't make that deeper is that because there is uh, a confined amount of space for the residential neighborhood and bringing the uh, commercial mixed policy back further along these uh, parcels would leave us with relatively um, limited developable land for the residential neighborhoods and have um, significant impacts on already developed residential land. And what we're looking for with this mixed-use corridor policy is enhancement of the existing developed condition. We're looking for things like better access management, better um, building and parking placement, improved connectivity, landscaping, and signage, and trying to bring the buildings a little bit closer. There's a small area of T4 urban mixed-use neighborhood, a policy similar to what you would see in places like Germantown and Berry Hill, that is applied to part of Dupontonia right near the marina. <laughs> and this is an area that, while predominantly residential, does contain some mixture of businesses in there. And this would um, continue to develop that way. There's quite a bit of vacant land in there, and there is interest in continuing to develop it in a similar manner. And the goal for the area is to build on its diversity of uses and its unique character, character along with its accessible location that's adjacent to the school and marina and the neighboring Old Hickory community. Finally, there is the urban mixed-use corridor, and this is the part of Lakewood that is on the National His Register of Historic Places, where the buildings are built right up to the edge of the sidewalk, those older commercial buildings, and there's very strong interest in maintaining and perhaps even expanding that pattern, which can occur, this same pattern can occur in the suburban mixed-use corridor policy, although it's not mandated to occur. And uh, changes that would be looked for in terms of enhancement are similar to what we would look for in the suburban mixed-use corridor. So the staff recommendation is to approve, and this concludes the staff presentation. Thank I'll be presenting items two and three. Uh, these um, items are, that are to transition the former city of Lakewood zoning to the Metro Zoning Code. Staff have worked with District 11 Councilman Darren Jernigan, the Metro Codes Department, and the Metro Legal Department, and the community to transition the former city code to the Metro Zoning Code. The approach that was taken by staff has been to rezone to the closest equivalent zoning district that Metro has and to maintain the status quo as much as possible. There were six Lakewood zoning districts and we're proposing 13 zoning districts um, to be applied. This is the current city of Lakewood zoning. There was an active park, the passive park. Um, there was a small piece of agricultural uh, zoning. The yellow is the residential zoning. The pink is commercial limited. And then they had a commercial zone, which is shown in red, that allowed more uses than the commercial limited. Um, Metro doesn't have an, an equivalent park district, so for the two parks in the city of Lakewood, we're proposing an SP. Um, 
the staff worked with parks, the Parks Department staff to develop these SPs for the Lakewood City Parks. And these SPs closely match the Lakewood zoning districts while being consistent with Metro Parks policies and practices. The park district is intended to preserve parkland for both active and passive recreation, and the open space district is to protect parkland for passive recreation. And staff is recommending approval with conditions of this SP. There are a number of residential districts and mixed use districts proposed for the rest of um, Maine, uh, Lakewood. At this time, there's only one property left that was zoned agricultural. It does not meet the minimum standards for the agricultural zoning districts in the Metro Code. There is a single family home on the property and we're proposing to rezone that to RS20. Uh, for the residentially zoned properties, staff identif identified the various areas with different prevailing lot sizes and matched them with the closest metro residential zoning districts. As Lakewood's minimum lot size for two family structures was 32,000 square feet and the majority of the properties are below this size, RS zoning districts were applied. The Lakewood Code permitted single family residents and this new zoning will continue this. Most lots will meet the new minimum lot size and there will be few opportunities for further subdivision. The smaller number of duplex units will become non-conforming, but for many this is not a change as they were already non-conforming because they didn't meet the minimum lot size requirements of the Lakewood Zoning Code. The majority of the larger lots are proposed for the RS20 zoning district. An analysis of these lots found that due to the metro requirement for only 25% duplexes um, when there are four more lots, the RS20 district with a 20,000 square foot minimum lot size uh, generally provided the same unit yield as the Lakewood zoning requiring a 32,000 square lot for a duplex unit. There are also a number of multifamily uh, properties and these are proposed for RM15, which most closely matches the entitlement that would be under the, uh, the Lakewood Code. There were a number of properties that were partially in Lakewood and mostly in um, Davidson County. And what we've done for these is extend the existing Davidson County zone to these properties. Lakewood had two commercial districts and uh, that were mixed use districts because both commercial and residential uses were allowed. The closest equivalent metro zoning districts for the commercial limited is the MUN district and that's going to be applied in the area shown in pink and the MUL district um, for the area shown in red. There is a small portion that we're proposing that should say MULA, I don't know what doesn't show up on this, um, that to, for the historic properties that um, to allow them to remain closer to the street. It provides for setbacks that are much shallower than uh, regular MUL zoning. And staff recommends approval of the uh, proposed zoning district. The Coast Department is working with the various property owners who have legally non-conforming uses under the Lakewood Code or will have uses that become non-conforming under the proposed zoning to allow these uses to continue. The Zoning Examination Chief has prepared zoning letters based on documentation provided by the property owners. As I mentioned earlier, a key factor in determining which zoning districts to apply at this time was to find the closest district to the existing Lakewood zoning. In the various community meetings held to discuss the transition, a number of property owners indicated an interest in rezoning to a different zoning district. In order to ensure the most transparent transition of zoning, staff is recommending that the equivalent zone be used at this time. Once Metro zoning has been adopted and the new community plan land use policies are in place, staff will work with property owners in pursuing other zoning districts. Staff is proposing for a period of one year that would end in December 2012 that the planning department co-sponsor zone changes in Lakewood that meet the amended community plan policies and have the support of the council members. In conclusion, staff recommends that the proposed Lakewood Park and Open Space SP be approved with conditions and the rezoning of the remaining Lakewood properties to the closest metro district be approved. Thank you. This item be open for public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak in support of the uh, recommendation of the uh, staff to come forward? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition?
Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street. I represent Harold and Kathy Bone, who have owned the property at 3209 Old Hickory Boulevard. That's parcel 268. They've owned that for 24 years. It's a mobile home park that's actually been there since 1967. And the problem they've run into is they learned a few years ago that their property was bisected by a zoning district. The front three quarters is commercial, the back quarter is residential. And there's about 30 mobile home units sitting on this, on this entire piece of property. And so uh, I can tell you, having participated on behalf of the Citizens to Reform Lakewood, uh, there were more than just one close election uh, in throwing the citizens, uh, throwing the government of Lakewood out of business. There was an election in August of 2010. There was a one-vote margin, and then they had to do that over again in March by agreement, and so they won by 11 votes. So we're here because the city of Lakewood uh, is no more, and the citizens reform Lakewood, of which the Bones were particularly influential in that effort, uh, participated in that effort. But during that effort, they learned that their property was bisected by the zoning district. And so their request of this commission is, is twofold. One, apply the T3CM policy to the remaining one quarter of their property. Uh, and, and secondly, recommend to Metro Council that that portion also be rezoned to mixed use limited. Earlier today, I emailed a letter um, to your office and hope that you may all have had a chance to take a look, that, look at that. Attached to it is the tax record that where we depict, uh, you can see the mobile homes uh, situated on the property. You can see the back of the property that we're talking about here today. So i uh, be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, we appreciate your, your consideration. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, is a motion to close the public hearing? Second. A motion to second close the public hearing. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Hunter? I've got uh, a couple of questions. Um, first, on the SP districts for the open space uh, and parks. Um, most of our parks, what are they zoned? They have a variety of zoning districts. There's not a single one that applies to the parks. Probably agricultural. They're, they're or agricultural. Residential. There's residential. There's commercial districts. Um, there's a variety, but we don't have a specific district that would apply to to parks generally. Okay. We've had, had have had discussion about creating a district. It's just it's a very difficult district to create because all the parks are a little different. Mm -hmm. And so that was the decision to be true to the city of Lakewood was to put these in an SP that were specific to these two parks. And then the second question relative to the SP is, um, is it intentional uh, that community centers are not included in allowable uses? I guess unless you consider them accessory uses. Are, are you talking about in the open space, the passive one? Uh, I'm looking at park district and open space district, and maybe I miss, maybe I uh, skipped over it, but I'm not seeing community center as an allowable use, and with all the great community centers that we've developed over the last few years. This was deliberate. What we did was we took the language of the existing, the, the, um, the legislation that formed these two parks, and took that almost word for word and put it into this SP as we had committed to the, um, the people of Lakewood. And the Parks Department did look at the, um, and changed a few words to make sure that it actually met with the park practices. And so for the, um, for that open space district, that is what was intended. We, we took what was permitted currently and moved it into the, um, this new district. Was, was there opposition to ex expanding that to allow other recreational and public uses? What we understood from the uh, people we spoke with that those two park districts were created very specific, specifically the way they were created. There was a lot of discussion in Lakewood when they were formed and they were quite anxious that we didn't alter them. So if the parks department wanted to build a community center, they would have to amend, amend the SP? The SP. I guess. Um, Actually, though, if you look at number one, municipal recreation facilities would be, I think, 
consider a community center. So you probably could do a community center under the what is permitted there. Okay. And then I guess um, relative to uh, Mr. Henry's comments, um, has the staff? Um, I guess I'd like to ask the staff to respond to, to the request. And I don't know if the, these conversations have already been had previously when you went through the process or not. Or I'll speak to the zoning and then Cindy can speak to the community plan. Uh, for, as far as the zoning is concerned, right now that property has the split zoning with a portion of it having residential and a portion of it having the commercial. And as we did with every property, uh, we applied the closest mes metro district. So it has residential on the portion that was residential and the MUL on the portion that was commercial. We did not um, change anybody's zoning in that way. There were a number of people who had requested it. We want to be as transparent and as equal as we could be. We also didn't want to lose um, any specific property in the larger rezoning and have it look like we were trying to push something through. It, yeah, let me just mention this with regard to the zoning because the community plan, you have, I think, a little more flexibility. The, with regard to the zoning, that bill has been filed and it would could not be, it, it would be in effect an upzone to change that as Mr. Henry is suggesting. What we have offered to do and I, what Brenda outlined was to sponsor a rezoning request through the year 2012 when that issue could be fully vetted in that, in that regard. Now, you do have the ability with the comp plan to deal with it there and Cindy can address that issue. With reference to the community plan, we had not, as I had mentioned, brought the um, mixed use corridor policy back any deeper than the cur current zoning of those properties exists today because the vision is not to deepen it any further than it is currently in place today. The lots that are deep, and it may show up better on some of her slides are bright colors. Um, the lots that now are deep and are approximately 400 feet deep, that is a good depth for commercial development. But the issue that you can see a little more plainly on this colorful slide is that there's not a great deal of residential left, and particularly as you move in this direction and begin to deepen these lots uh, commercially, it has pretty significant impacts. You would take away approximately half of this res residential street, Anthony Drive, if you started setting that precedent. And also we were aware that a mobile home park is residential. And so that use is residential that's currently there now. It's been zoned residential. It backs up to residential. There was never any um, thought to our mind or in the minds of the people that were in the community that that land that's back there would be used commercially. And also back to a point that Brenda had made, again with the transparency, we preferred not to um, accommodate specific properties. And there were other ones that came up in other areas through this process, but would prefer that they came through in the subsequent year. And certainly the community plan can be amended as well. Um, during that any you, period. You want to point out exactly where that property is on this page? Yes, let's see if I can. It's right here. Is that it, Brenda? Yeah, it's right there. That's one. Right there. It's, it's. And it's going into the RS5? That's correct. And could you, um, there's a MUL, a couple of MUL properties just to the north of that uh, that are ad adjacent to it? Yes. Can you describe what, what those currently That's are? That's the apartments. There were a number of multifamily properties in Lakewood. There are those two properties that are right here, and then there was another one here that were actually multifamily. And um, when they re when they changed their zoning districts in 2008, they made those uh, put those in the commercial because, as I said, the commercial allowed both uh, commercial uses and residential. And so, because they had the commercial zoning, that we applied the mixed use zoning onto those properties. And then the one to the, um, I guess, to the southeast that extends beyond sort of that line. Do you know what that? This one here? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what's there at the, this moment, but it had the commercial zoning, and so we, we kept the commercial zoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the, sorry, back to the two properties just to the north. Um, 
what, what's the recommended policy for those areas? That was it in the um, T4, the T4 neighborhood maintenance. And I'm trying to see if I can get back to my slideshow, but. Would allow would allow uh, multifamily. Oh right? yes, yes it would. Um, but we had had that the, that use the the multifamily conforms to the policy, but the mixed use limited zoning that's there would be a non-conforming zoning within the policy. We recognize that it's there, but would prefer not to expand it. So the site that you were just asking about that was the apartment zone MUL is right about where my pointer is. So there was some discussion about whether or not to do a mixed use neighborhood in that portion of that area of the Dupontonia neighborhood but, and we debated it for quite a while but since it was really desired for that to be residential. We didn't see rec just the fact that there was one apartment complex there that happened to be zoned something different than it was used to be a reason to base an entire mixed-use neighborhood on one um, develop, small development. Though with the, with the proposed zoning, they could by right go in there and develop commercial uses. Right. I mean, you can almost imagine the shape of it reminds me in some sense of that kind of that edge hill um, development in that it turns in an L. And I should say now that with that commercial zoning in Lakewood, under Lakewood, they could have done the same. Right. So we haven't changed that with this mm -hmm. MUL. Right. Okay. And so we do have, I guess, the ability here to... Um, amend the policy, not necessarily uh, amend the recommended zoning, um, which, and, and remind me, with the, the 12 months uh, where the planning department would sponsor uh, we, zone change. We, we've agreed to sponsor those basically so that they, there would not be an application fee. Okay. That does not, I just want to make sure that does not mean that we would necessarily spon agree with the recommendation, but we would sponsor it. Under, understand, and that's uh, if the council member. Uh, right. Right. supports it and if it's consistent with the policy. Correct. So we, that's an option we have to, to amend the map, the proposed map. Stuart? That's all I've got. Thank you. The agricultural zoning change uh, that eliminates agricultural, I, I take it that's, there's been no opposition to that? There has not, and it was a very small piece of property. I believe before they put the park zoning on, that all that property was zoned agricultural. And okay. so with the, um, the purchase of the park land and just that one little remnant parcel, you had a very odd piece, of left, piece left with agriculture. All right. You mentioned that we were making some of this non-conforming that was not prior non-conforming use. Uh, and that some wasn't, some was already not conforming, but could you elaborate a little bit more and show us exactly where we are making someone's property non-conforming when it was not already um, non-conforming? Sorry, I have to keep going back and forth through these. One, um, is this property here that's zoned um, commercial? It's actually a dog grooming business, and the MUL policy wouldn't allow a dog grooming business um, the MUL zoning just doesn't permit dog grooming, but they'll be grandfathered in. They've worked with uh, the, the codes department to demonstrate that they were legally in place and uh, they would be able to continue that use. What is the practical effect on that property owner of it making it non-conforming? I don't believe that there is any impact necessarily, but um, Joey Hargis is here and he may be able to um, add anything to that. I think they have some limit in how much they could expand, but it's not a large property. And I'm not sure there's any room for expansion. What happens if it um, is, what happens if there's a fire, for instance? 
I'm going to have to ask Joy to give you that. I, I could <laughs> think I could give you the answer, but I have Joy here to answer that. That's probably perfectly capable. Of addressing that too. Sorry, uh, commissioners. I really haven't been to your meeting yet, so uh, turn me on. Um, I'm Joey Hargis. I'm the zoning examination chief, and really, I was here to just watch and uh, from a that'll teach you. Yeah, it will teach me uh, <laughs> from a uh, pending ordinance doctrine perspective going forward into tomorrow morning. Uh, for us, the the protections provided to that use under 13728 would still govern. Uh, as well, if we have a use that is not protected by the state statute, Metro's uh, 174650 would govern uh, dealing with yeah, fires and such. In, in the example of the dog groomer, she was able to provide us uh, proof from the city itself of Lakewood of business licenses and permits for her use, and we wrote her a letter that she's legally non-conforming as to Lakewood's current zoning code. Mm -hmm. She came in under a prior code which oh, actually allowed her uh, the use there. And then going forward to provide her some protections in this rezoning that she would understand from our perspective that she's vested in her use uh, as a legally non-conforming use. Now, we have she had, was actually legally non-conforming under Lakewood. Under the current Lakewood zoning code that they're operating, that we're currently operating under okay. now. Uh, she came in under their prior code. Right. I can't think of too many uses that we came across that actually we would be making non-conforming that weren't already non-conforming. When the city changed its zoning in 2008, a lot of the uses became non-conforming that were particularly in the commercial district. Okay. That, and I, I do want to compliment your staff and uh, Mr. Bernhardt working with them. They, every effort was made to not create new non-conformities. And there are, so there are a couple. This is one example. There, there's no avoiding it. Um, there are some existing non-conforming car lots in this uh, Lakewood zoning code, which are currently non-conforming to the existing yeah. Lakewood base zoning. But um, I don't. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that at all. I just don't want to make someone non-conforming without. A real good reason that sure. they're currently conforming. <laughs> yes, sir. And, uh, and every effort was made during the processes to avoid that, and they've, okay. they've done a really good job. Well, there's a couple. This is an example. It's unavoidable. So. All right. That's all. That's Judy. And that was going to be my comment. I want to just commend the staff for the way you have worked with the uh, community. I remember uh, the workshop that I attended that talked about how you would do this. And I think that you all have done an outstanding job to help maintain the status quo and to do the equivalent zoning uh, to match it as near as possible. So I have no problem with this. Thank you. So, uh, my compliments also to the staff. The only question I have is, does this change the speed limit on uh, Old Lincoln Boulevard? I don't believe that's within the zoning code purview, but we'd love to. I will, I will note, however, that uh, speed limits are now enforced by the Metro Police Department. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I, am, I am very comfortable with this, and particularly knowing that we've got a year for review and it will not cost the residents anything uh, to have well, that. Uh, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because Bob reminded me to tell you that it's we would co-sponsor if it meets our policy. We are if someone comes in and doesn't and wants to rezone something that wouldn't meet the policy, then we wouldn't be able to co-sponsor it. It's when they bring in a request that meets the policy. I understand. Okay. Now, one quick question: uh, the city hall, the old city hall for Lakewood, is that located in this little park area? No, it's actually in one of the MUL districts. I believe it's right here. In this area okay. here. All right. Good. Uh, so, if uh, we wanted to make that into a community center, we could. Okay. Just thank well, you. Well, there's other issues with the, yes. the city hall building. It, it has a reversion clause. To a resident yeah. or Our, the former did, owner. For, yeah. The former owner. Well, okay. Here, there's the question. Yeah, but it doesn't have any parking though. If it does revert. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Councilman Claiborne. Thank you. I, I have one question just for uh, clarification before I make a comment. Uh, you're talking about the uh, dog groomer. Um, if she sells her property, then does that have to come in to a conforming use? 
I believe, and I can again look at Joy, that it doesn't matter, it's not the owner of the business, it's the use. And so as long as it stays in use and there's not the, the period of time that lapses between uh, different businesses doesn't exceed what's permitted under the state law or Metro Code, then they could continue with that use. But if the use changed, it, then it would have to yes. conform. Yes. The, the use runs with the land. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, my compliments to the staff. Uh, I've um, heard uh, Councilman Jernigan talk uh, several times about this uh, process. It's been long, sometimes uh, difficult, and um, uh, I think that uh, the staff has done a, uh, an excellent job in trying to work with the community. And I see great wisdom in what you have done in trying to uh, mirror the existing uses to the extent that you can and set that as a baseline and then to provide this 12-month window for some transitions that people might uh, require. I think if, uh, if you, having done all the work that you've done, if you try to go back at this point in time and try to address each individual uh, question or concern or, or desire to change, I, I think it, it would be like taking a puzzle that had been put together and tearing it all up and trying to put it back together again. <laughs> So uh, I think there's great wisdom in the, in the path that you've taken here, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable with what you've done, and uh, congratulate uh, everybody that's involved in it. Andre? Um, yeah, I echo all of that. I don't want to repeat it um, about the compliments. The, the RS-20 is, you'd said that you were moving it to RS-20, the little piece that's inside the park. That's right. And that that was the, the plan use was for conservation. Uh, the, uh, the policy that's being I mean, put on it is because it's actually in the floodplain. And so that's why it's got the conservation um, policy on it. The property is about 30,000 square feet in size, and so the the uh, RS-20 wouldn't allow for a subdivision of that property. It would remain as it is. Okay, so that, that the use of a single family house would continue. That's correct. And it, that's nothing it, we want to try and undo at this point. No. Right? Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, there was a slide that you had that had the, had, I think there were black squares, there was a lot of REM15 that you ran through. Oh, morning. yes. And I felt like I'd Sorry. sort of missed something. That one. Okay. Or, the one, pro that one. That one there, okay. Those were just the various zoning districts we applied. We looked at the majority of the lot sizes. What we didn't want to do is apply RS-20 everywhere, which was what the minimum lot size was under the Lakewood Code, because then we had a lot of smaller lots that would be very difficult with the setback requirements and other bulk standards to actually develop. So we looked at lot sizes, tried to find them so there weren't any twice as big, so you wouldn't be able to subdivide further. We weren't giving additional development rights. There, there may be some that can. And we didn't want to make too many substandard lots for the districts. And then there was one that had RM15. Is there? Those are existing multifamily buildings. And the RM15 is, a, is about equivalent to what you could have developed, the density you could have developed under Lakewood. Okay. Um, I guess regarding the split zoning question, Hunter, you were saying that we could change the policy at this point to allow for future changes in the zoning but not address the zoning. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that's what I understand. I mean, we have, we have that option, obviously, suggesting a change in the zoning without really a public hearing about right. that. You know, I'm not sure anyone here will be comfortable with that. Are there but, any uh, other split zoning lots along there? Uh, there are a few. Um, I believe this one is as well. And there, some of these other ones might be. I, I can't tell because the zoning line and the uh, property line crosses over. But there, there, there aren't many with split zoning. Well, I can see your logic in not wanting to sawtooth back and forth in there and you're trying to protect the residential in that area, though, where the we already have two MULs, it just I think split zoning is so strange that I think I might be for the idea of having the policy allow for the potential, and then if it could be agreed upon by the community, that the zoning might change at some point. I think I'd support that. That's all. Thank you. Uh, my newest member, I'd like to introduce him to the uh, TV audience. Is, uh, <laughs> Mr. Atkinson, Greg Atkinson. 
It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, and I uh, look forward to working with you all. And uh, since I'm new, uh, I'll uh, I hopefully won't say too much, uh, or at least as much as Stuart says. I'm just kidding. Um, I, actually, I do <clears throat> have a question. I guess on the on the dog grooming issue, though. Um, when you say that uh, you, if it changes use, does that mean if it ever is not a dog grooming business or what? But I always get confused on what that means. Or could it be a cat grooming place? Is well, it, it, would, it would be inclusive of, of grooming animals uh, of, of the two. But for, for the use itself, uh, changes of use, our zoning ordinance now allows the Board of Zoning Appeals the authority to, to change from one non-conforming use to another uh, built into the current zoning code. And the basis the, the BCA looks at is whether the new proposed use is less intense than the use that currently sits on there. Uh, we get very few of those cases before our board now. Um, but as far as the use itself, looking at uh, abandonment of the use or, uh, or a change, a true change of the use would require how we would handle it under this adoption would be to look at the base zoning metros adopting and see does this new proposed use meet the current zoning code. Uh, if it does, then fine, we would proceed on as we would any other uh, business that changes from maybe retail to restaurant and vice versa. If we have one that's that's truly different, it would fall under the Board of Zoning Appeals' authority to either grant a change of from one use that is currently legally non-conforming to another uh, non-conforming use. The goal is to get it to a conforming use, ideally, as a, as a policy for the city. Uh, but, but looming in the background, and, uh, and a very large background, is, is the uh, state protections provided to non-conforming uses within local governments, jurisdictions. So we can't violate the state law protections that they're afforded. No, absolutely, and I, I understand that. Um, but thank you for the sure. clarification on the problem. use. That, that makes sense. Can I have one other thought, I think, is that that wouldn't preclude it being some form of commercial. It just couldn't. It would just have to fit within the MUL. So it's, it's not saying it won't be commercial anymore, even though the surrounding area is um, RS5. I want to reintroduce a new commissioner. Greg Atkins, my neighbor, <laughs> and he was kind enough not to embarrass me, but uh, I apologize. <laughs> Derek? Yes, uh, Hunter uh, brought up the question that uh, I was interested in learning, and that was in regards to Mr. Henry's concerns, and uh, staff did adequately uh, address those as far as I'm concerned. I think this is a, a nice plan that you all put together, and a lot of hard work went into this, and I am comfortable with uh, staff's recommendations, and I move for approval of staff recommendations. Second. Okay. Uh, is it the wish of the uh, commission to take uh, items one, two, and three separately on the vote or vote on them yeah. as one? Let's do them separate. So let's vote on item one, which is the community plan amendment to amend the Donaldson Herbage Old Hickory Community Plan, which is a 2004 update for the city of Lakewood. Mr. Yes. Um, I just, I guess I would like to ask uh, the other commissioners if um, how they feel about the, the community plan amendment. Uh, Let's get a motion in. You can, you know. I thought there was already a motion. There's been a motion. Is there, there's been a motion to okay. Is there, okay. Is there okay. discussion of that? Yeah, this is yeah. discussion time, right? <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure there was a motion. That's all. I want to make sure there was a motion. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to know how the other commissioners feel about. Um, I have some some concern that um, we have two properties that could develop into a number of different commercial uses nearby. One's directly adjacent. Um, I understand the staff has taken the approach of status quo uh, with the zoning and, and even with the policy, um, for the most part. Um, but there may be an opportunity here. Um, and, and I don't know if the staff has necessarily looked at this, um, but, you know, is there a, a small neighborhood commercial, you know, node that could ultimately occur at this location and being able to connect through from, um, from Old Hickory Boulevard through this particular property? If it remains residential, it may just be a trailer park forever. Um, 
and are we, you know, they, are, are there, I guess there's a few single family homes to the, to the east. Um, I, I, I'm curious if any commissioners, I'd like to hear any other commissioners take on the potential of uh, changing the policy to that entire property. Stuart? I'm not necessarily opposed to considering that in the near future, but I, I think I would feel comfortable, more comfortable with it having a, a plan change like that, having much more discussion before it gets to us mm -hmm. with the area and the council member. It may be something we do in two months, but I, I think it would uh, take away, I think status quo is a good way, <laughs> way to handle the very unusual incorporating of an area into a new government. So I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable doing it today, but certainly we should keep an open mind on it. That's what I would say. Yeah. comment? And, and I would, too. Um, at some point after all this is said and done, now they'll come back and do their own community plan. Mm, the entire Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory community plan is due to be updated in the next few years, so this will be looked at again even without an amendment in the fairly near future. Mm -hmm. But certainly it could be looked at separately with a full discussion before then even. Before then. Other comments? Rick? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing, though, that I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Clifton, um, but what, what about the cost of the zone change? I think could we, in two months, could we, um, would they have to pay for it if we approve the plan today, or would, would that be something that we could consider? I mean, I think that's where... I mean, at least. Well, I mean, under the that under the, the at least the current policy that we're suggesting is it would need to be in con, in conformity with the policy. Um, you could, by hearing that, say that uh, you would be willing for the staff to support it on this with to bring it forward for for a full discussion without paying a fee. You can you can set that yourself. So you you're you're okay with that? Yeah. This particular this this, this particular, particular piece. Lot, yeah. Two sixty eight right. parcel. This only one. Okay. Thank you. That makes me feel better. Other comments? Okay, we've got a motion second on item one uh, to approve with the staff uh, presentation. This is, I'm sorry, um, would this be an appropriate time to amend it to, to reflect what Rick just suggested? We'll, we'll do that at the end. I'll, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All in favor, item one. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Item one. Is adopted. Item two is a zone change. Is there a motion on that? That's the zone change. That's the SP. On the That's the two SPs SP. on the parks. Lakewood Park and Open Space. Got a motion second for item two. Any comments? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Item three is a zone change, total zone change. Is there a motion second on that? Item three. Second. Motion second on item three. Any discussion from any commissioners? Any comments? Hunter? I'd like to uh, ask to amend that motion to include the subject property we've been discussing uh, to, um, just to... Just to clarify, then, this would vote on the recommendation for the rezoning and authorized staff to file a co-file or co file uh, zoning applications for any property that uh, is consistent with the policy plan and this one piece of property we've talked about. But Rick, we've got a go ahead. Rick. I think I think to make things fair and consistent is not just for this property, but since it's a split property, okay. I think that's kind of where right. if, if any split zoning property okay. I think that would be the fair approach because I don't want to do it for just one That's particular. Fine. That is, if the applicant, better, if the owner better, requested. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Who, who made the motion? I did. And who second? You did. So you, you're okay with the changes to this? Well, I'm making a motion, I guess, to amend. That's fine. The, okay. the motion. We need to, we need to vote, on, vote on the amendment first. Okay. Right. Okay. There's, there's well, then I second it if it if you meant that it applies to all split split zone yes, pieces. Yes. Thank you. Okay. We'll vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Amendment carries. 
the vote on item three, which is motion second. As amended. As amended. So any discussion, any comments from the commissioners? If not, on item three, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So that is now official. We will now take up the uh, sign at the uh, Temple Baptist. Okay, item number four is a request to rezone a portion of property in the Bordeaux area located at 3810 Kings Lane. The overall property is outlined in red. This is the Temple Baptist Church site. The area to be rezoned is approximately 871 square feet and is outlined in the gray area. It's actually a little smaller in that gray area, but if we actually got 871 square feet, you probably wouldn't see it. So it's a small area and it's adjacent to Kings Lane. Staff is recommending disapproval. The existing zoning is single family residential RS15. The proposed zoning is specific plan and is intended to permit an, an LED sign. This is a picture of the existing sign that was taken in August. This slide shows a rendering or a mock up of the proposed sign. It utilizes the existing sign structure that's uh, currently there and includes a 33 square foot LED reader board, which is not permitted under the current zoning. Uh, staff is recommending disapproval for sev several reasons. First, the request is not consistent with the long range plan. This is in the Whites Creek Bordeaux community plan. The policies are single family detached and residential low medium, which calls for single family with a density of two to four dwelling units per acre. Uh, staff considers electronic signs to be more commercial in nature and commercial type uses and, and zonings would not be appropriate in residential policy areas. Uh, second, this proposal is not consistent with the surrounding residential development pattern. Uh, this slide shows the existing development pattern. The star is the location of uh, the approximate location of the sign. The uh, yellow and orange uh, areas are single family and two family. And the, I call that C green, uh, which is like across the street and right adjacent to the property are vacant residential properties. And then the closest commercial it uses and commercial zoning is on Clarksville Pike, which is to the east. Um, also, as proposed, a request would be would not meet current requirements intended to protect residents from nuisances associated with electronic signs. Uh, the, the code requires that signs of four feet in height or less be set back 100 feet from any property that's zoned for agricultural or residentially zoned property areas. Uh, but it also requires that for each additional foot in height that you have to be set back in another 25 foot. Um, as proposed, this sign would need to be set back 300 feet from any residential property. As proposed, the request would have a zero setback and would be and would circumvent that requirement to intended to protect the neighborhood. Sorry about that. Finally, staff is recommending disapproval because approval would be inconsistent with previous with previous um, <coughs> excuse me. With previous um, recommendations by the Planning Commission. Uh, the first four were approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, in those cases, and I keep hitting the wrong button, I'm sorry about that. Four of the previous proposals were approved by the Commission. Staff recommended that, that they the first three weren't consistent with the land use policy. However, the commission found each request to be consistent with the policy, citing specific circumstances, including consistency with the surrounding commercial zoning and land uses. The, the fourth was consistent with the, plan, with the land use policy. And it's also important to know that all four of these that were approved would meet the setback requirements that are found in the zoning code. The, the last request in the table, this is the most recent that was that is most similar to the current request. The commission disapproved that request, specifically citing that it was not consistent with the land use policy, it was not consistent with the surrounding development pattern, and that it set a bad precedence for similar requests in residential areas. So in conclusion, staff is recommending disapproval as a request. It's not consistent with the land use policy. It is not consistent with the surrounding development pattern. It 
avoids the setback requirements in the zoning code and sets a bad precedence for future zonings in residential areas. Thank you. This item is open for public hearing. The applicant will be allowed 10 minutes. Is there a representative here for the applicant? Okay, anyone wishing? Are you speaking for the applicant? Uh, I'm Ben Williams with Whitsign Company, and this is Mr. White. He's with Temple Baptist Church, and um, we just, I, I did the sign for the... Hey, uh, You'll you be allowed 10 minutes if you need that, and you can keep two minutes of those for rebuttal if you'd like. Okay. I wanted to let you I know just, uh, I just want to say a few things for the sign. The sign is just going to be for information to, for the community and everything like that. That will be uh, the reason for the sign. So, uh, and another thing is, if you go back, can you go, can you go back about two slides, one or two slides on yours? That one right there. If you look over on Clarksville Pike um, in the green area where we just rezoned over at Word of Life uh, Church across from. Uh, the credit union i don't know if that one got put on here but we just rezoned that property to put that sign up and it was a electronic digital sign um it was back in 2010 uh, we just went through this process and did that if on the back side of that property is all the um uh, residential zoning across the street exactly like what we're doing here and um it's about the same it might be just a little bit more um, distance for the signs, but we could only go, I think, about eight feet or ten feet tall because it was so far away from residential. Kind of the same thing that we're doing with this sign. So it kind of falls in that same the same jurisdiction that we're going through here. So that's just what I wanted y'all to kind of look at for the Word of Life. It's kind of the same thing that we're doing for Temple Baptist. So if y'all can just look at that. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support of the applicant? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition, please come forward. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Mina Johnson. I live at 6600 Fox Hollow Road, about 40 miles from this property. You may wonder why I'm here and why I care about this particular rezoning request. It is because the entire city of Nashville will be brought into very peculiar, or one might say very dangerous uh, situation if commissioner approves uh, this zone change. By approving this zone change, you will be disregarding not only community plan and land use policy, but also Metro Zoning Code. I respect the commissioner uh, have authority to interpret a land use policy and community plan sometimes against staff recommendation where, where it's appropriate. However, I do not believe commissioners have authority to override or rewrite uh, Metro Zoning Code. My biggest concern is uh, the usage of SP zoning in this property. Uh, I don't have to tell you, SP stands for specific plan. Using SP as sign placing zoning is uh, just to change less than 0.1% of the property is nothing but abuse, in my humble opinion. Uh, I felt urged to speak uh, in hope to stop this kind of absurd SP zoning usage before it spread like wildfire. So thank you for listening and please disapprove this rezoning change request. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Charlotte Cooper. I live at 3409 Trimble Road. Thank you for the opportunity to address my concerns to you today. 
I do not believe LED signage has a place in residential neighborhoods, any residential neighborhood. I do not live in the neighborhood affected by this ordinance. However, if this ordinance is approved, it will set a dangerous precedent for all neighborhoods, neighborhoods across Nashville, my neighborhood, your neighborhood, all neighborhoods. I don't believe, um, I'm sorry, residential neighborhoods depend on the Metro zoning codes, the community plans, and the community character manual. And I believe this ordinance is inconsistent with each of these. I doubt that SP zoning was ever intended to be used to rezone a small portion of a larger property for the sole purpose of installing an LED sign in residential neighborhoods. The property at 3810 Kings Lane is zoned RS. The properties to the right are zoned RS. The properties to the left are zoned RS. And the properties across the street are zoned RS. In my opinion, this request is entirely inappropriate. LED signage does not belong in any residential neighborhood. Last month, a similar, similar ordinance came before this commission, and after careful discussion, you voted to disapprove that ordinance. I hope you will use the same sound reasoning and disapprove this ordinance by voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Trish Bolian. I live in the Hillwood area of Nashville. I'm here today to request that you vote down the proposal before you. As some of you know, a great deal of work has been done on LEDs over the past two years. Informal task forces, formal task forces, a huge public hearing before you on this issue with over 300 neighborhood representatives at that meeting, many of whom were association presidents representing thousands of homes in the city all of whom ask that you not allow LEDs in neighborhoods. The feeling is the same now as it, as it was then. As mentioned before, other pertinent factors here are SP zoning. The language in the specific SP zoning was created for large, specific plans to maximize the integrity and character of each community, not to create spot zoning. The request before you is clearly spot zoning, taking 0.02 acres of land and somehow have that 0.02 acres being called SP zoning is spot zoning. Two, an LED sign 15 feet away from surrounding residential zoning is a clear violation of the distance requirement. Churches choose to be in neighborhoods due to the character of the neighborhoods, and in many times, in cases, the land is cheaper than that which is zoned commercial. Once in a residential neighborhood, however, the character of the neighborhood they choose to build in must be protected. Commercial signage, such as LED signage, has no place in neighborhoods, and all churches must take into account the residential character of the neighborhood they choose to build in. Again, I ask you to vote no. Thank you. Say anything? Okay. Second. Motion is second. Close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Phil Claiborne. I'm. Um, I'm kind of torn here. I'll make some comments, but uh, I'm interested to see what some of the other folks on the panel have to say. I have a couple of questions that uh, maybe the uh, the sign uh, person can answer for us. Uh, the uh, the color involved in this uh, display or the, is this red or amber or what? What is the color? The sign is red. 
down the display will be red, the LEDs. The display is red, so it's a, it's a dark red background with brighter yes, red lettering. Yes, you can red letters or red background or anything like that. You can change it. It's, done, it's changed by a computer on the inside, and you can do it like that. Okay, so is the intent of this to have a, a scrolling message, or is it like a static change? Where um, you, can either, you can either set it to scroll in, or you can just set it to come up in a static and be static. A Metro's code is it has to hold for eight seconds, so it can do that. Um, you can either set it in residential, you can set it to, uh, you know, hold for eight seconds and then before it goes to its next message and do it like that. Um, you can set it to be at a dimmer uh, when it gets like nighttime and everything, they think it's going to be too bright. You can set it to be uh, dimmer, you know, be like nighttime, be 60% brightness so it won't be as bright and do things like that to accommodate everybody. Okay, and that uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, with the the lumens. Is that the correct term for the? Uh, it's nits on nits. LEDs. Oh well, okay, but the brightness of the sign. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if uh, compared to uh, is this other? Uh, can you go back in the to the what the sign looks like now? Councilman, while he's finding that slide for you, I want to point out that uh, scrolling signs are not permitted in Davidson County. So even though the technology may be in the sign, that's not permitted uh, to be used that way. Okay. So is there uh, lighting on this sign that's presently in place? No, that one is just like a temporary sign. Okay. The other one got blown down. Okay, the sign that was there, was there lighting on it? Yes, it was internally illuminated. It was internally illuminated? Yes. Okay, so uh, tell us um, in terms of the uh, the brightness, uh, if it was internally illuminated, then it was it was the way it was. It couldn't be made brighter or, or dimmer, right? Correct. So in terms of the, uh, the area of illumination of the previous sign, it was internally illuminated. How do, how would that compare with uh, the the brightness of, of this proposed sign? Uh, they'll be about the same. If you could if you could change to the 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 new sketch, I don't I don't think I have a picture of the old one. The only one I had of the old sign that they did have. Let's see was on the ground, and they had an all-white sign, so it illuminated the area uh, very well. With It had fluorescent lights inside, and so it stayed on, I assume, all night. And this one will have an internally illuminated sign on top, which will have a dark background, which will be less illuminated than the other sign that they had, but with the LED, so it would be about the same. So would the... Uh, Except for the message will change. I know you're the you're just the guy who makes the sign, but would the um, uh, it would be able to be dimmed at a say a certain time at night? Correct. Or, you could even or in, turned like, off or like in some places we go in residential areas, they have them turn it off nine ten o'clock until five o'clock the next morning, four o'clock, five o'clock the next morning. That's a compromise they kind of make for residential areas. They have them set it at a certain nit and then uh, turn the sign off at uh, 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I talked with uh, Councilman Matthews uh, about the situation, and um, he has uh, indicated that he's only had one complaint from people that actually live in the area and that he is um, determined that the the impact of the, the the four closest residences because of vegetation and and how far back they sit from the road um, that there's minimal uh, impact that the sign would have. I, I do have a problem with uh, some of the our some of the objections that the staff has. I have some of the same problems, but this is a is a unique situation in that there is so much open space around it. And um, 
I just uh, I'm not sure at this point. Uh, I'd like to hear what let, some other let me folks just have point to say. out one thing because I think this is a very important uh, <clears throat> element that the commission needs to consider in its debate, um, and, and it's partly why Jason showed the, rea the the comparables to the commission in the past. This is a f if I mean the last one you had like this, which basically eliminated the spacing requirement and was completely surrounded by residential. The commission voted down. This has basically got the same situation. The dilemma is that once you begin going down that road, you may very well not be able to change that. If if you got into another part of town where the neighbors objected, then you've already set a precedent for approving those sets of facts. And, and you're going to get into a situation where you may very well find yourself in violation of federal law. Uh, and we're trying to kind of balance that out and keep, keep you out of any uh, issue with uh, the uh, our lupa requirements that uh, um, that would be fact based as opposed to opinion based where you know if you had a room you could have the same facts but a room full of people that are in here and if you get into that situation you're going to get into trouble if you turn that down on the same roughly the same fact base I'm very comfortable with what staff has said. Uh, I think that there's some good reasoning there, and um, I'm very much um, in favor of disapproval in this case. But I am curious about one thing. Uh, the um, sign um, representative mentioned the other nearby, uh, I guess it was a church, that got approved. Uh, is that one of the five that you brought up? Yes, yes sir. That is... Um Pike Can you flip to that? that? That was a Cartsville Pike Church. That is, if, uh, it's not on. It's not on our list. It was Word of Life Church. That was in 2010. I think this. It may have been name change. It? I think this is it. Oh, is that it? Because this was. It was zoned previously. It was zoned CL. Yeah. And yeah, it was rezoned to CS to permit the sign. It wasn't an SP zoning. It was a CS zoning. So it was just a, a small little area. As you can tell, it's just a. A little bitty area, um, and it met the setback requirement. I think the sign that they you did with, since it was CS, they didn't have to give us a sign profile or give us anything showing what was going to be built. But they did, and it was really tall. But they had to scale that down because because of that regulation requiring that they have to be set back so far. Okay. So you really couldn't put it in the same category with this request. No, as you see, all the property right around it is specifically around that was zoned commercial. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, you know, basically to me, uh, SP in this place, uh, in this case, means spot problem. Uh, thank you, and I was going to bring that up too. I think that uh, he, he brought up the Word of Life Church, but that was a totally different um, uh, animal. Uh, I'm comfortable with the staff's recommendation. I. Um, uh, you know, it does not meet the setback, and there are residential areas right across the street from it, and I don't think that that's the road we want to go down at this time. I was um, privileged to be appointed to the uh, to the committee by the vice mayor that looked into this, and we spent 73 years, it felt like, um, <laughs> looking into it. And we really felt like it was important to come up with some way to avoid an ad hoc decision making. And we bent over backwards and possibly bent too far over in coming up with a proposal that would allow, uh, without rezoning, something like what they want. But in our wildest dreams, no serious alternative ever would have covered this. Uh, that what we had hoped for was a consensus or near consensus where if there was enough um, separation from residential and a small enough sign and all of this that we could maybe support something. Um, but that's not what we have here. Uh, I am very comfortable also with the staff recommendation, um, not because of any problem with Temple Baptist or the church in Madison that we voted voted against their sign just a few weeks ago. Both of these are wonderful community-minded institutions. Mm -hmm. It makes it very hard to vote against them. But as making a planning decision, it's really not very close to me. It's, it's, I don't even buy the full argument of, of our, our folks who had um, opinions 
that that these signs don't belong in residential. It happens to be the law, though. I mean, my, what my opinion is about that is immaterial. Our law is that it doesn't go in residential. Um, I've always felt that there were some situations where backlit signs were worse than what some of these might be, and under certain circumstances with certain distances it might work. That's not what we have here. So uh, I guess I, I just, just have to say that whatever the political considerations might be um, of who's against it in the general area and whether or not from a political standpoint, it makes sense to sponsor something like this. From a planning perspective, it, it really is not something we should be approving, I don't think. Right. I agree with uh, all of those comments and um, would note, too, that the, the, the four examples that were put here, uh, of those that we did approve, uh, none of those used SP zoning for this case, and I would be concerned um, about setting that precedent as well. Well, I guess I, I do have some comments. Um, I was really going to try not to talk very much, but being freshly off the council, um, these these LED sign issues have come up, and I know they're controversial. Um, and being, uh, there's several former council members here, and, and I think overall my, my honest opinion, which I will always give you, is that LED signs... Um, you know, should be considered on a case-to-case -case basis. Now, what's good for one community, quite frankly, may not be great for another community. What I do find compelling, though, is is the letter that the councilman gave us that um, the place of worship is almost like a community center. Uh, they display their messaging. Um, very low impact to the residents. There's lots of open space there with lots of vegetation around. If you looked at the pictures, and I know the area, I'd be remiss to say that two or three of those residences could even see the sign. Um, the community was very pleased with the other sign. I think that um, the councilman brought this because the people of the community wanted it. So that's my councilman hat. Okay. Um, I think there's an inherent problem, though, that we're facing that even in Creve Hall, there's an LED sign where I'm from on a Church of Christ there, and it's right next door to a residential neighborhood. I personally like this sign. I can see what's going on at the church. A lot of my neighbors see that. Um, I think that it doesn't meet the policy plan, but I think maybe a solution, this is just my comments, that it should be uh, a quick when you're considering an, a community plan, which I've been involved with, thanks to Rick, he allowed me and my community to be very involved in a community plan, you don't sit there and say, well, at this church, do you think that there's going to be an LED sign? You don't consider that in the policy plan. With my commissioner hat on, though, here, uh, I, I think we're kind of bound by, by the rules here. Um, but I think that there uh, has to be a bigger discussion about this because otherwise we're going to keep saying the same things over and over and over again. Um, now, I'm going to support uh, what uh, the, the staff is saying here, um, but it is something that I don't want to do. That's my honest opinion. Uh, I'm sure I'll be faced with a lot of those decisions like you all are, but that's uh, my feedback on this, is that the community has asked for it, the community wants it, um, our hands are tied. Um, but there, I think overall, we, we have to figure out a solution with this, whether it's the council or us, or us being a recommended body. And I know this is a very controversial issue, but when a community asks for something, and it fits that community, it makes no sense why we are telling somebody no to a great thing, which would be to inform the community about what's going on at the church. That's my two cents. Thank you, Chairman. I still don't think SP is the appropriate tool. So I would say that I support, um, I mean, even if that 
conversation comes up at some point and we discuss it in the future, I don't think SP is the right tool. And I agree with Hunter, all these others were asking to be zoned to CS. Um, I agree with the staff recommendation and I think that if that whole committee's decision that was for the county-wide needs to be revisited, then you can chair that committee. I bet Stuart won't Another serve volunteer. on it. <laughs> um, I recommend Stuart again. <laughs> anyway, I move uh, approval of staff recommendation. Second. Motion and second to approve the staff recommendation. Uh, 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 just, one, just one thing, um, the Historic Zoning Commission uh, next week on November 1st is going to be taking our annual tour of the city, uh, seeing some of the projects that have been um, that have been developed under, I guess, the authority of the of the zoning uh, of the Historic Zoning Commission. So that'll that'll be interesting. I think. What area of town is that? Downtown or some of the? I think it'll include. Uh, you know, different historic conservation and zoning districts across the across the county. Is that tour? Is that open to public? Is that just for the commissioners? That's a good question. I don't know. It's got to be a public meeting. I suspect. <laughs> I suspect yeah. it is. A well, I mean, is this meeting. in lieu of your regular monthly meeting, or no. in addition to it? No, it's in, it's in addition. <laughs> is that it? That's it. Okay, anything from Parks and Recreation? We'd like to mention also. What was that? And also, uh, on uh, November the 1st, when you get through your historical tour, drop by the Parks Department meeting, which will start at noon at uh, the Parks Department on Holman. And one of the major things we'll be looking at is the uh, request to purchase about 150 or 60 acres of land that is now currently called Ravenwood Country Club. And that will be a process having to go to the council for approval and funding and so, so forth. But uh, anyway, this is part of the process. <clears throat> and the other thing is we are still continuing our process of uh, selecting a permanent uh, director for parks. Uh, it was boiled down to three applicants, the last I heard, and we'll go from there with uh, interviews and so forth. Thank you. That's it. Uh, there is no executive com committee report. We haven't met in some time, so probably yeah, probably need to. Um, Rick, uh, a couple of things. One, I, I appreciate y'all giving me a little time off. I had a, a great time over in the Smokies and then up in New England and did a lot of studying of small New England towns. They were very, very nice. Um, as compared to where we were yesterday, which was Newport and the mansions. A very different kind of uh, small town, big houses. Um, several of the towns would have fit in several of the ha one of the houses or two. <laughs> so, uh, but nevertheless, very nice. Um, I want to particularly draw your attention to next Friday, a week from tomorrow. I think all of you have uh, this down for a continuing education opportunity with Robin Rather. That will start at 1.30. Uh, it's going to be in the National Conference Room, and she, this will be a really not a, as much of a teaching type of thing as it is a facilitated discussion with you. She has volunteered to come in at uh, only, we're only covering her cost of travel, no, no cost to her at all, um, and she's going to meet with our staff in the morning, and she's going to meet with the commission in the afternoon, and she is someone that has worked with National uh, APA, she's worked with the Smart Growth Coalition, um, She's done an awful lot of independent research and, and does a wonderful job of talking about uh, new, per, to, new per, uh, perceptions and the political realities for planning. And um, I became familiar with her. They, they, she was brought in um, a month ago when we had our retreat up at Harvard, the one we have annually, the big city planning directors, where they bring in the planning directors of the 30 largest cities. And we spent probably two-thirds of a day with her in terms of this discussion about uh, um, um, the role of planning in today's political situation and, and how um, how issues are discussed and, and talked about. And I think you'll find her extremely fascinating. Um, she's she's just done a, a lot of research and, and uh, can share that information and, and draw that out with you. And I think that Kelly's been in contact with a lot of you, and, and I would 
I would just strongly recommend. I think it'll be an opportunity that you wouldn't want to turn down. How many uh, plan to be here? Well, it'll probably, I mean, it'll last roughly as long as you want to. I mean, it's going to probably last till four or so. It's, like I said, it's a facilitated thing. So if you have to leave, it's, it's you know, you probably can. But uh, um, for whatever it's worth, it's uh, Dan Rather's daughter. So, um, but she's very knowledgeable. So uh, in terms of her ability to facilitate a discussion. So well, 1.30 a week from tomorrow, Nashville. The lawyer report? Um, oh, no, it didn't, actually. I've got a couple of other things. We, uh, Jennifer Higgs and Craig have been working to put together an interactive maps page. We've got a lot of maps on our, um, our web page, but what they're going to do is consolidate those maps into one page so you can go there if you want information on it'll have our property maps, our development tracker, our the SP search map, the council district maps, the flood maps, um, the Nash fatality maps, all of those will be at one place so you don't have to kind of hunt them on the website. Um, and we've also just finished um, a website for the Mayor's 5K Challenge um, that you may want to take into uh, consideration. We're finishing up the Bellevue Community Plan or we're in the, in the final stages of that. The next meeting on that is next Thursday um, to discuss that. Um, as we've already gone through in Lakewood, uh, that will go to council public hearing next week, November 1st, uh, for its, its public hearing there. Um, and the next key thing I guess I have is a, there's a, a planning commission workshop in December, December 8th. That's when we're going to talk about Midtown and the Broadway West End Alternatives Analysis, which is a major transit uh, study that's currently underway uh, with the MPO and uh, MTA. So, uh, but the key thing is just uh, if, if I could not encourage you strongly enough, uh, for next Friday I think you'll find it both interesting and uh, hopefully educational and, and we really would like your participation. I think you'll find it find it a good, worthy uh, afternoon spin. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Claiborne, any legislative update? Um, question for, are you going to provide tutorials on all of that map uh, consolidation? or? Oh, sure. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. I still have trouble with the GIS, uh, oh. just getting streets to come up sometimes. Uh, the council is, uh, as you, uh, Rick said, uh, we have po our first public hearing of this uh, new council coming up next Tuesday, and um, things are beginning to pick up speed. The thing that you will may hear some chatter about uh, over the next uh, two or three weeks is the um, proposal by the Titans LP field for upgrades on the stadium. We had a uh, working session this morning, the uh, Tourism and Convention Committee and uh, Finance Director and uh, the Titans folks and uh, talked about their proposal and uh, there were some questions that came out of that that will probably uh, catch the attention of uh, media as we go forward, so but that's probably the biggest thing on the horizon. Thank you. Uh, Hunter? I, I've just got one question. Okay. For Rick, are we going to hear another urban chicken bill? <laughs> uh, that's up to the council. I hear that one's either in the process or has been filed, so. Um, First grade. Yeah. It won't be on public hearing until January, though, so it could be for us. We are going to check and see if the commission's recommendation on the last bill may uh, may still rise. Yeah. Yeah. It may, may. So we don't have to hear? Well, we'll have to look at it. Your, your recommendations are good for two years, so uh, we'll have to check and see if, if it's close enough to what you had last time. <laughs> the... Um, The retreat date, we, we've come up to a short uh, window of opportunity because we've been waiting on the uh, new uh, commissioner from the council and uh, the new commissioner, Greg. Uh, the date, opt optimum date, is November the 12th, Saturday, November the 12th. The mayor is available that morning to come at 9 o'clock, and Belmont is available on that date. Um, can you look at your day timers now and just tell me if that's, tell me how many people? I will not do that. Okay. So no for Phil. 
Anybody else that can't make it on that day? What time? Uh, generally, try to be there by 8, have a little breakfast, uh, you know, coffee, donuts, and then start by about 8.30. And uh, then we try to adjourn no later than 1 o'clock. So. Does that work for everybody else? Okay, I don't know about Jeff. And um, the, that, that's on Saturday. The day after that, on Sunday, the November 13th, is the 5K walk run. And I'd like to encourage as many people to come. I'm not a runner, but I have walked this summer uh, with the mayor as far as, you know, three and a half miles. Uh, and in, it's pretty easy, and it's all down, it's in a downtown area. But even if, you know, if you can't walk the entire area you can at least start and i'd like to have a, a great showing from the uh, from the commission i know a lot of the staff is uh working on that so. oh okay i was going to say or you all could join our team our church will have a team out there mm -hmm. I, thought, um, I wonder if we could rent a car. And just kind of <laughs> rent a car. You, you are allowed golf carts, but you're going to be segue. but you're going to be laughed at. So uh, just put that down. Any other thing anybody wants to say? We stand adjourned.